All right. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. The book of Ephesians chapter 4. And we want to continue our study about Christian service. And uh, we find ourselves in verses 11 um, to 16. And please stand as we read God's word. I would like to uh, invite everyone to stand and let's read beginning in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by the waves of, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what, what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You may now take your seat. And the title of our study this morning is Serving the Servants, Part 2, and this is Part 10 of our series break, Set Apart for God's Service, and we've been studying the subject of Christian service for 10 weeks now, and the goal is to study the doctrine of uh, spiritual gift or gifts, and before we get there, we're climbing this ladder of uh, different topics. And to help us build a foundation and hopefully we can better understand and utilize our spiritual gifts. And we spent five weeks in Romans chapter 12 looking at different principles in service. And we said last time that Christian service is spiritual service. The tools are spiritual. The goal is spiritual. And we look at spiritual estimation, spiritual disciplines. Um, spiritual attitude towards other believers and towards our enemies. And we also talk about serving the risen Messiah, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you remember uh, last Resurrection Sunday. And that's the reason why we're here. We're not serving ourselves. We're, we're, we're not serving an organization. We're not serving a foundation or any earthly institution. We're serving a person. We're serving Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so our labor is not in vain. And because we serve Christ, Him crucified, we cannot avoid persecution. We cannot avoid hatred from the world. And the world despises us. And so we spent two Sundays talking about uh, serving in suffering, that we continue to serve the Lord Jesus Christ even in suffering, and that is in 1 Peter chapter 4. And we said those who live a godly life will be persecuted. And now we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're now kind of entering the doorway of spiritual gifts. And last Sunday, we talked about the spiritual source. Uh, Christ gave each one a unique, free, and complete Spiritual gift. Spiritual gift is like a fingerprint. It is unique to you and to you alone. If God can make a unique fingerprint, He can make a unique spiritual gift. And it is free. It's free. It is Christ's gift to His church. And so therefore, your spiritual gift is not for you. It is the person next to you. Your spiritual gift is to edify the body of Christ, to edify the body of Christ. And you have a responsibility 
to other Christian. You have a part to his or her Christian walk. You have a part, you have a contribution to his or her sanctification. And your part is unique, it is special, and it cannot be replaced by any Christian. And so what I'm trying to say, if you're not using your spiritual gifts, there's a, a missing link. If you're not employing your gift, you're missing you're a missing ingredient in someone's life. That's the point. And one of the reasons why the church is anemic, why, one of the reasons why the church is uh, weak and, and superficial and shallow, it's because someone is not employing their spiritual gifts. And we're relying to these man-made uh, strategies. Our attitude should be like this, church. As a Christian, I have a duty to my church. I need them. They need me. My spiritual gift is part of their Christian walk, and I have a contribution to their sanctification. That's our attitude. And I'm part of the building, building off of God's church. And my primary tool, the number one tool that I have to influence other Christians is my spiritual gift. That's your number one tool. That's your tool to influence other Christians. And we also said last week that the gift we receive is complete. It is sufficient. We lack nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ covered everything. He came from heaven. He went down on earth. And he went down to the lower parts of the earth. And ascended back to heaven. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 28, And I will be with you always. Till the end of the age. And you got what you need to serve. And so you don't want to look for, for other gifts. Whatever gift you have is sufficient to glorify God. At the end of the day, it is how you use your spiritual gift, right? No matter how you know, small or special, it is how you use it. And so today, we want to continue in verse 11. And the question is, if I have a unique, if I have a free and complete gift, who's going to help me with my spiritual gift? Who's going to equip me and build me up? If, if godliness is crucial in, in employing my spiritual gift, who's going to help me walk in a manner worthy of my calling? And obviously, you can see in verses 11 to 16, there's your answer in verse 11. Paul said, and he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Verses 11 to 6, there are five headings. And we will examine the first heading today in verse 11. And the, the first heading is, Servants of the saints. Servants of the saints. And there are two things I want you to remember in verse 11. First, Christ's gift. Christ's gift. Second, Christ's design. So we want to look at verse 11 today. And that is servants of the saints. So let's look at Christ's gift. He said in verse 11, and he gave, and he gave. And so the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, has chosen to rule through godly leaders. And in here, in verse 11, we can see uh, classes of leaders. And the emphasis here is the phrase, he gave. We see the love and concern of Jesus Christ for his church. He gave his life to his church. And he gave gifted men to his church. And here again, we see the idea of giving. We see the idea of God's grace. Christ gave gifts to his church. In verses 7 to 10, he gave spiritual gift. In verse 11, he gave gifted office. Gifted office. Well, now which tells us that these leaders have no authority over the church. But they are a demonstration of Christ's graciousness to his church. 
they should be a blessing to the church, gift from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are two things we want to do with the gift. Two things. First, we want to test the gift, right? We want to test the gift. And faith is a gift that must be tested. You have the, uh, the gift of salvation, and you are tested if you truly receive the gift. And the same is true in the church. You must examine the pastor if he's a gift from God or not. Is he um, heavenly appointed? If you look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, they were appointed. And so you want to check, you want to test if he's uh, appointed, heavenly appointed. Why? Because no church, no Christian organization, no Bible school can produce a faithful servant of the Lord. Only God, the giver of gifts, can produce this man. Therefore, when you look for a church, listen, what you need to discern for a pastor, it's not who has the best smile. It's not who can give you the best um, experience or who has the best uh, personality or gimmicks. What you need to ask first is, is he given by Christ? That's the number one thing you want to ask. Did he come from Christ? And that's why if you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, and this is a familiar, a familiar text. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says there, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And the spirit there is, is a person. And he said, to see whether they are from God. Because why? Many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John chapter 4. And so if you want to know if the pastor is given by God, you have to test it. And it demands what? Time and truth. Why? Because time and truth go hand in hand. It takes time. You cannot test a pastor with just one visit. You cannot test the pastor just by looking at the externals. It takes time. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, please. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, in here Paul writing to Timothy and telling Timothy, pastor in Ephesus, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Verse 21, he said, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, do nothing in the spirit of partiality. Look at verse 22. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby, thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself from, from sin. In other words, do not immediately ordain a spiritual leader. Now we're going to skip verse 23. Look at verse 24. The sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. And then he said, for others, their sins follow after. Likewise, also deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. And again, time and truth go hand in hand. Sometimes you can know it immediately. Sometimes uh, sin will show later. I mean, it took uh, three years for, you know, um, for Judas to, sh to really show up his sin. And so first, we want to test the man with the Bible. If that man is truly a gift from God. Number two, we want to appreciate and imitate. If you turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 12, it says there, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And so after testing... And if you find it, it's, it's true, it's a true gift, a genuine gift, and so what you need to do is to appreciate it, right? That's what you do with a gift. You appreciate it, 
and imitate it. In Hebrews 13 verse 7, it says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. And so listen, folks. If the gift truly represents Christ, we're not to look for other gifts. You see, that's a problem here in um, the Corinthian church. In beginning in chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians, you can see there, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. There's division. And I understand that people have preferences. That's why whenever there's a change in leadership, that's why whenever there's a um, a change in, in, in a pastor, the church naturally declines in number. But we need to be careful with that because that could lead to a misplaced loyalty. That could lead to a favoritism. In fact, that could lead to quarreling. And listen, most of all, that could lead to what? Ingratitude. Why? Because Christ gave these leaders, to his church. That could lead to ingratitude because you think you deserve a better pastor than what you have. And so you need to begin with that perspective. A gift must be received, must be tested, and must be received with gratitude because if a pastor is rejected, Christ is thereby rejected. The Lord knows what he needs to build his church And sometimes we receive what we don't want. We need it. Sometimes we receive what we don't want. You need a house. You pray for a house. God gave you a house. You may not like it, but it's a house. Right? A car is a car, and sometimes it doesn't matter if you like it or not, as long as it takes you from point A to point B. A watch is a watch, and it doesn't matter if you have an expensive watch or just an ordinary watch, as long as what? It tells you the right time. Sometimes you don't want it, but you need it, and whenever we insist on what we want, what happens is it ends up in disaster. And so it's better to trust God. We need to appreciate God's gift. To his church. And so these are the things we want to be mindful when we think of God's grace to his church. And again, verse 11, it says, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. These are the Christ's gift to his church. And so I want to ask you, have you ever thought about asking yourself, How can I know if the pastor is a gift from God? You know, before joining a church, you know, normally if you want to join a church, we look at the externals, you know, the ministry, the music and everything. Have you ever thought about asking yourself, is this a gift from God? And that's a fair question to ask. So that's number one, Christ's gift. Second is Christ's design. Look again in verse 11. Again, he designed his church. He he planned. He he arranged. He he lay out the shape, the form. He builds his church. And so the question is, how did he design it? And so let me give you a list. Number one, he designed the office for the church. If you can turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, it says there, And God has appointed in the church, and the word in means the spear, right? These offices are designed for the people of God, the church. And that speaks of the spear of responsibility. The office is not for selfish gain, but for the interest of the church. A pastor is not a politician. So his agenda is not political. He's not a businessman. And so he doesn't apply business uh, technique or marketing strategy 
you know, serving what the people want. In other words, the church is not a product to sell to the world. And so I'm not a comedian. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here a, mo a motiva motivational speaker. I'm, I'm not here to give you a, a pep talk. The office of the pastor is designed for the church, and you are the church, right? Church is people. So that's number one. Number two, he designed the office in sequential order. If you're looking at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, it says, and as you notice, the emphasis there is first, right? And second and third. There's an order. Sequential. These are classes of gifted men. And uh, the first two groups here were limited to the beginning of church history. The apostles and the prophets, they're, they're limited because they, they have this unique part in building up the foundation of the church. They have this foundational role. And they were to establish the churches. So if you're in Ephesians, go to chapter 2, verse 20. Ephesians 2, verse 20 it says, They're having built... On the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, right? And so the office of the apostles and prophets were limited. They were the uh, first stage of, uh, of Christian church in history. And we all know that the foundation of a building is laid once. It is applied at the beginning of construction. And part of the foundation is the apostles and the prophets. So let's uh, look at the first, first one, the uh, apostle. This is the first of the gifted men in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ is the first apostle. If you look at in Hebrews 3, verse 1. It says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of heavenly calling, consider Jesus, it says, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He's the first apostle. And that word simply means the one sent on a mission. Uh, that means a messenger. That means uh, an ambassador, a representative. It has a narrow, strict meaning, meaning this term, apostle. That's why you can see uh, in the letters, um, Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ. That's a technical term. The narrow sense of that term. They were the apostles of Jesus Christ. And to be qualified for this group, there's three um, quali qualifications. Three basic qualifications. And this is really Sunday school. First, they were chosen directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. Handpicked by Jesus Christ. That's first qualification. Second, they were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. You can go to 1 Corinthians 15 and you can see that. They were eyewitnesses. Third, they could perform signs, wonders, and miracles. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, it says... The signs of a true apostles were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. And I want to tell you right now, we don't have an apostles anymore. The office is closed. Simply because the foundation is already laid and their job is done. No more apostles, no more prophets. On the other hand, there's a general sense of this word. Like if you look at uh, Acts 14, verse 4, a Barnabas in 1 Thessalonians 2, 6, Silas and Timothy, they, uh, these men were called the messengers of the church. For example, in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23, it says there, As for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the church, a glory to Christ. That is a general term, a messenger. And so there is a technical term, and there is a, a general term of this word apostle. But again, the 13 apostles were the apostles of Jesus Christ, 12 plus um, Paul. And that, is, and that has a strict qualification. 
Nobody replaced them after they died. The office of the apostles has ended, and there are no more apostles today. Now, how about the missionaries? Are they the modern-day apostles? Um, sure, if you're using that in a general sense, but uh, I would suggest, I really don't like calling them apostles. We call them missionaries, right? Missionaries. You know, just to avoid confusion, let's just call them missionaries. Now, the second class we see here is the prophets. The prophets, right? And the word means one who speaks or a spokesman. Prophets were the spokesmen of God. And they were second rank, second rank to the apostles. They delivered this uh, new revelation from God. Meaning to say, you know, they speak for, F-O-R-E, and sometimes they explain what has previously re revealed. In other words, they speak forth, F-O-R-T-H. So that's what they do. And because there are a lot of false prophets, and so the people of God perform three tests. Three tests. Number one is doctrinal purity. Second is moral purity. And third is accuracy, meaning prophetic accuracy. If they uh, give a prophecy, it must come true. And because the New Testament was completed, the prophetic office was no longer needed. Like the apostles, the office of the prophets has ended. Why? Simply because we have the completed revelation of God, the Old and New Testament. And so we don't need their, their prophecy. We don't need extra revelation from God. The prophets were part of laying off the foundation. And so let me ask you, do you believe the apostles and prophets exist today? In my estimation, many believe they had ceased. Even... Uh, you know, um, many charismatics believe they, uh, they had seas. But the problem is this, and let me ask you this, do you believe the apostolic signs or sign gifts still exist today? Meaning the signs and wonders, the gifts of healing, the gifts of miracles, the speaking of tongues. Do you believe that those gifts exist today? And that's a crucial question because what you believe on this issue will actually determine how you live as a Christian, right? Will determine how you live as a Christian. It will affect your faithfulness. And in fact, many false uh, teachers came out of this um, wonky idea of um, sign gifts, you know, including the uh, prosperity gospel meaning the health and wealth prosperity gospel. That is God's will for you to be healthy and wealthy. And so that's a question. Does sign gift still exist today? And we will answer that next time when we um, move to 1 Corinthians. In the meantime, let's look at the third office, the evangelist. But think about that, right? Does God uh, give gifts of healing and miracles? And so you need to ask yourself. And we will look at that uh, next time. Now, here, the, the office of the evangelist. If you look at verse 11, again, you see the office of the evangelist. And this word, evangelist, we only, we only see this term twice in the New Testament. First, in Acts 21, verse 8, uh, Philip is described as an evangelist. And Paul instructed Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy 4.5 to do the work of an evangelist twice in the New Testament. And so evangelists are called to proclaim the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now all of us are called to be witness, Matthew 28. We're all commissioned by Christ to proclaim the gospel, but the evangelists are uniquely gifted by God at reaching the lost sinners. These are gifted men. Now, let me say this very quickly. I believe that the evangelist is not a person 
who goes from town to town with John 3.16 message that he repeats over and over. I don't believe that. You know, preaching the gospel on the streets. You can call that witnessing, but I don't think that is evangel- you know, the gift of evangelist or this uh, guy who goes from church to church as a guest speaker. I don't think that that's an evangelist especially if that person doesn't belong to a church. You know, like a lone ranger. Because Paul said that Christ gave evangelists in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. They were appointed in the church. And so I believe a church must have an evangelist, not a lone ranger, but a part of the church. And he has a home base. In fact, I believe the evangelist is a church planter. He goes out and proclaims the good news and, and stay there for a while and train a man, train godly men who's ready to receive the baton and pastor the church. That's what I believe. And the evangelist moves to the next town and repeat the process. And so they move they plan the church, they train, they stay there, train the pastor, and then pass the baton, right? To the pastor. And I think that's what Jesus did. He preaches the gospel from town to town, and he carries the believers with him. He ate with them and lived with them, and trained and teach them, and commissioned them to plant churches in the book of Acts. That's what we see from Paul. After planting a church, he passes the baton to Timothy. He passes the baton to Titus. I have a friend back in the Philippines who is a pastor, and I believe that uh, he's a, an evangelist. You know, if you, find me, uh, if you find me dry, that person is, is a drought. But he can gather people, and he plants churches. He, he personally trained the pastor, sent them to Bible school, and then pass the baton to the pastor. And let me tell you, he's really um, a boring preacher. And I'm wondering why people listen to him. What a gift. And so be careful with these people with a nice smile and charismatic personality going from church to church, going around, uh, you know, towns uh, with, uh, with a recycled sermon. You know, one sermon preached a hundred times and asking you to support them. On the other hand, we need to pray for a gifted evangelist in our church, uniquely gifted by God to reach the lost sinners with the saving truth of the gospel. That's what we need. Now, the last office is the pastor-teacher. And we will spare this for next week as we look at verses 12 to 16. Let me give you a roadmap for um, maybe next week. And here we see in verse 12, the servant's assignment. In verse 12, let me just give you the heading, okay? Verse 13, servants of vision. In verse 14, servants product. In verse 15 to 16, servants goal. In the meantime, we need to remember the grace of God. Christ gave gifts to each one of us, spiritual gift. Individually. And he gave gifts to his church, to the whole body. He he gave gifted men. And listen, our duty is to walk in a manner worthy of our calling and removing uh, the sin that blocks our eyes and use God's word as our lens to examine and discern if the servant is truly from heaven or not. You see, you need to be like the Bereans. In Acts 17 verse 11, it says there, Now these were more noble-minded, they think. It says, then those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness 
examining the scriptures. They don't examine the pastor. They examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. In other words, if you're not diligently studying the scripture, if you're not diligently and daily studying the word of God, you don't have a way to examine the pastor. You don't have a way. I can fake it till I make it. You know, emotion cannot help you. Your intuition cannot help you. Your experience cannot help you. You need to study the scripture. You know, to discern the truth. Because Satan can create what? A counterfeit gift. Right? And you'll never know what's inside until it's too late. True? Not all glitter is what? Gold. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts you have given your church. You have given, you have given us yourself. You have given us your son. And our service is just a response to your to your grace. You decided to use us despite of us to build your church here in Swift. Bless us now as we attempt to serve you for you alone deserve our labor. In Christ's name, amen.